the legal copyright world side of things. And so I made this film and uh, got lots of really good stuff on it, but obviously a controversial film because it was taking on Monsanto. And yes. when we were when we were finished, uh, once the university caught wind of it, they basically uh, put, started putting the you know the wheels in motion to shut it down. And so um, it was three years since we finished the film before we actually released it. Mm. Um, and there was massive uh, uh, legal uh, threats and stuff, and it was quite a quite an ordeal. And um, I just I ultimately didn't release it because I didn't want to go against the wishes of the professor and the student because they were you know they were fearing for everything <laughs> mm-hmm, right. because of, uh, because of this. And so uh, we eventually did release it, and of course you know the sky didn't fall and. <laughs> Uh, um, it was good to finally get it out, but there was there was massive pressure to. Uh, we had an investor that was investing, and he was actually bought out by the university uh, to kind of suppress the film. Really? So it was quite a, it was a big lesson for me on how it all kind of works, especially in that realm, and and um, and also introduced me to Monsanto and biotech, and kind of what spurred me to go to the Amazon the first time because I knew I knew biotech was playing a big role in the Amazon, so. Um, thought I'd kind of continue. Uh, that sounds inter- interesting. I want to ask you more about that, but in, in regards yeah. to just going back and, and talking about the yeah. mentality of some of these people and so forth, I mean, uh, what's your uh, what's kind of your outlook on it right now? We have, you know, as you probably know, Codex going in pretty soon. We have all these different, I mean, the, the companies are still around. They're, they're you know, uh, yeah, yeah. more powerful than ever in a way, actually, and, and they're still going. What's your outlook on it all? Well, it's very radically different right now because, uh, I mean, one thing I've come to terms with uh, through, you know, Juan and ayahuasca and stuff is that uh, gene- genetic engineering isn't bad inherently, right? The te- it's not the technology, it's the intent behind it. Right. And um, and I also, another end, you know, I increasingly, I don't really give human agency very much uh, power. Like, I, I understand that it's still the plants running the show. And so... I feel there's some greater process we're all going through right now, and it might seem so horrible, and what these people might be doing seems so horrible. But once we get our intent in line, and once we get healed as a people, a humanity, then these sciences will then can be directed towards good things. And ultimately, I would believe that it's the plants that are directing us to that goal, right? So um, it's a very radical, different view than where I was, you know, you know, <laughs> when I made this film. But I increasingly, increasingly am am uh, conscious of uh, who's actually really running the show, and and uh, yes. and that we're all really just pawns of you know greater beings of the plants, you know. So so uh, with this film, do you think that that was kind of your first and kind of initial step into the world of uh, well, if you will, then I guess conspiracy in a, in a sense as well, you know, or at least looking into the controllers of of this planet, right? Yeah, I mean, I I'd, I'd been pretty aware. Up to, like I, you know, I was quite a political uh, junkie and uh, activist, and quite aware of global dynamics. But then, it really started to once I started seeing the science and just you know the madness of biotech and you know Monsanto and nanotech and and uh, things like that. Um, it really started making me question things and try to find some answers because um, it can it can definitely bring a, a lar- large amount of fear into someone when they when you're seeing what they're doing and you take it for what it is and what you see. Yes. Uh, so, and you, you know, it seems like it's going to be irreversible damage to the planet. Right. So, uh, but it was interesting that it took, uh, you know, an indigenous shaman from the Amazon to help me see differently. Yeah. So. Hmm. But, uh, still kind of, uh, that's kind of logical if you think about it in a way, because what, what we're doing here or what, you know, many people and companies, of course, in the Western world are doing is, so disconnected from nature to begin with, and we're we're only looking at what what they are doing, right? And we're kind yeah. of drawn into their world, and we can, might see the dangers, of course, but also in, in one regard the possibilities of where their promises, so to speak, of what they might be able to do with all of this. But I mean, again, going back to the anarchist movement, would you say because I'm just interesting generally in that, would would you say that the awareness, so to speak, of um, of the type of things that can, you know that we might discuss on this program that has to do with with the the conspiracy with the real controllers behind the scenes. Would you say that there's a general awareness of those kind of main play, players within the anarchist movement? No, I wouldn't necessarily. I mean, because 
you know, there's uh, especially with this rise of this 911 truth movement, which seems to, you know, I've got friends involved in that seem to get a little more caught up in the the kind of occult conspiracy elements of it, conspiracy elements of it. You don't really find that in a lot of the more hardcore anarchists. Uh, you know, they're very, you know, into the Noam Chomsky kind of view of the world. Yes. Um, so it's very literal structural problems. Uh, you know, it's not they don't delve into that more kind of deeper conspiracy stuff. So um, would you say, you know, this, I, so, yeah, sorry, on. please continue. Well, no, I just, and so for me, even I myself too, didn't really give much thought to that. And, and, and even to get to where I am today, I, I went through a deeper uh, conspiracy phase myself. Yes. <laughs> so. Yes. W would you say that uh, uh, the anarchist movement is, you know, obviously it's, it, it, it leans more towards the left than right, but would you say that they're steered away into the left kind of consciously because you mentioned Chomsky and a few other people and, and there are researchers out there who call these guys, you know, uh, left left gatekeepers basically that they go into certain areas but not into all areas, if you follow me. I, you know, I do agree. I do, you do see that, you know, I mean, I don't think it's necess it's a conscious thing and uh, I do think still, I would see still less the anarchists because I think the anarchists are dangerous and always historically have been dangerous, less so than maybe like, you know, more socialist marxist communist because uh because they don't you know necessarily answer to authorities and they're a uh, they're harder to control and so you know if you look historically they've been suppressed as a movement more violently than any um so i think uh you know i think they're a little bit more dangerous and you know and obviously they it's it goes everywhere some people are open to it some people aren't like And it's and I find it's it's really changing now too. Like, uh, you know, we've been through this crap now for a while, <laughs> <laughs> right? And, and, and people are starting to like you know look for different ways and seek in different places and stuff. So yes, I think the awake, awakening is is happening everywhere still too. Indeed, I mean, uh, in regards to protests, then I mean, there there are still countless of people who think that the only change you know that or if any change is gonna occur or happen in any way, they have to go out. And wave yeah. their, pla their placards and and uh, and protest in that regard. Do you think that's still a? Uh, is there a good element in that still, or is it all you know uh, basically uh, uh, you know no point in doing that? Well, I do think it's good. I think it's. Uh, uh, I don't think it's necessarily the solution, um, but I still think it's good for people to be mobilized and voice their sel themselves. Um, you know, it's you know it's just dangerous when you start to do it in a very oppositional way, right? And so when you uh, you start alienating uh, alienating others to get your message out, you know definitely is not the fastest route to achieving peace. Right. So uh, you know, um, and that's something that I've kind of been able to come around and see. But uh, I don't, you know, I just and you know, everyone's in different parts of their journey, of, of, and I, you know, I think, uh, you know, I still go to some protests because I get asked by lots of people to go and. Yes. Um, I still go, and I don't feel necessarily I'm doing something wrong by doing that. Or, and I, I ultimately believe, you know, you know, all these ideas about people uh, being the pawns of greater forces that are running the show. You know, I, I still believe, you know, the power resides in yourself, and um, yes, and it's as simple as believing that. You know, and that's a, that's a big step to take in a way, because again, it's that that then you're involved in a totally different journey than you're going into a journey that is more uh, has to do with the, the you know going into yourself and an inward journey so to speak because again many people are looking outside all the time and they're solely looking there obviously there is work to be done there that, you know <laughs> we shouldn't kid, kid ourselves here there's tremendous change that can take place on the external uh, you know level as well of course obviously but um But to make that kind of shift and to make that change, would you would you say that that solely came about when you became involved in some of the more sh shamanistic uh, traditional uh, you know rituals and things like this? I mean, it was definitely definitely it was um, it was the big trigger for it. I mean, I was a little bit more open to it than maybe some of the others, my other uh, peers at the time. But it was definitely when I started uh, working with ayahuasca and doing various indigenous ceremonies and working with some of these elders that I started doing that inner journey. And, you know, once I started seeing the world as one with me and, uh, you know, everything in projection from within and started to understand, you know, calm inside means calm outside, 
you know, that's kind of my mission as an activist is to help people achieve that themselves, you know. So um, I do find that is that is the that is how change will come is, uh, from within. You think the, that's the only way to go, so to speak, or, or do you think it's many, there are many different paths in order to um, achieve that same kind of level of, of uh, inner calm as you're talking about? I mean, what, what we're talking about right here is, is obviously has to do with the, the shamanistic approach in regards to ayahuasca, ayahuasca and so forth, but do you think there's other paths as well to, to that point? Definitely. There's definitely other paths, and I'm increasingly meeting people that are I'm find, finding great success in those other paths. Um, you know, I'm I'm definitely pretty uh, big believer in the the ayahuasca and the plants, um, but and I often get in arguments with people about that because you know people think it's a crutch to depend on the plants, and then I always answer, I'm like, well, you wouldn't be breathing without those plants right now, so you're already <laughs> dependent. On So why why discriminate between that you know like there is you know increasingly you know Juan Flores you know says how this is the world of the plants and it is the world of the plants um, we're totally dependent on them yes. and um, and so I do you know I do think they can, they have something to offer and and I you know for me it's uh, the shaman shamanistic path is quite quite powerful and uh, uh, it can you know it's helped helped me immensely and perhaps someone like me it, it was it was really useful because I wasn't into anything spiritual at the time i had no time for that right yes i was like no time for that we got stuff to do <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> there you go i i also want to mention here just that people can uh, drop by we, we were talking about seeds of change and i want to return to that again a little bit and talk more about that but the website for that is uh, seeds of change org, and that will get you to the website you can read more about it you can watch trailer and i think you even can watch the film online is, so, is that right yeah film free online yeah Oh, beautiful! Looking forward to seeing that later on. I haven't watched it yet, and uh, Arti- artistically, I can't watch it anymore. But that's still it's, it's <laughs> great in- information, and it's a good story. And yes, yes, uh, and you know, going back to that idea, we we're talking about some of the biotech companies and their kind of involvement, or I guess we can term it interest as well in in the Amazon. And and uh, in what area specifically would you say that they're involved? Are, are they interested in uh, you know finding out? Um, you know, taking or extracting, um, you know, medicine, uh, medicine, medicinal plants and things like this in order to uh, synthesize these substances and make them into drugs. What, what do you think is their main kind of motive here? I mean, that that was very much it, right? So um, uh, it's basically to uh, uh, rape indigenous knowledge. <laughs> yes. In, in every which way, right? So um, uh, you know, that's very much what's driving them down there. So, um, uh, kind of was the pointer for me to look into indigenous knowledge. Right. Yes. Uh, and, uh, yeah. And I mean, it's, it's interesting with the seeds of change is in the film it, the film is about basically, you know, Monsanto and their roundup ready, uh, genetically engineered crops. And one of the issues that happens with these crops is that, uh, there's these plants develop this resistance to, uh, the, the chemical really quick, And um, these other plants, like the, you know, these weeds, technically develop this resistance, and so they were really surprised at how quickly these plants just develop resistance. And I remember at the time thinking to myself, the plants are resisting. Yes. <laughs> you know, like what can I do to join them? <laughs> and I, I, I do feel that that, that was answered. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's that's pretty interesting. And uh, I mean, would you say that all their, you know, their 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 effort at this point seems to be controlling all the different elements. We can see it again with Codex, as I mentioned before, but we can also see it with the with the general kind of gen- genetic manipulation going on. That they will they're trying in different ways to control nature. They want to, you know, either some people say it's solely because of money. I think there's a, actually more kind of esoteric uh, yeah. side and issue to this as well that that shouldn't be neglected. But it, but if we focus on that the money aspect for now, then. Um, Do, do do you think it's solely because of of, of that idea that they want to control it and and uh, and uh, basically package it and sell it to people? Uh, would you say yeah, that you control you control food, people's food, you control them, right? It's it's you know, it's the source to total control. So I mean, I do definitely think there's that that level of plotting with getting people dependent on genetically 